trying to figure out my presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just a few weeks ago, I was surfing around the, uh, on the internet, and I found the most amazing information. I found a site called www.publicdata.com, and there I started looking through the site, and you could punch up driver's license numbers. It's just one example of all the kinds of information you can find on the internet. Now, while it isn't all illegal, you can actually find valid information. Uh, the uh, internet is, offers a wide variety of different opportunities to gain information. Today I'm going to explain how the internet works and what some of those opportunities to uh, do research on it is. At the end of this class, you should be able to explain how the internet was created, describe different functions and uses of the internet, detail the three parts of a domain name, and uh, give at least two sites, internet sites, where information can be researched. During my presentation, I'm going to probably be using a lot of lingo that may be foreign to you. I'm going to try to explain it as best I can, and if you have any particular questions, go ahead and ask me. But what I'm passing out is a small glossary that gives a couple of different terms that are common to a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, internet lingo, and if there's anything you don't understand, go ahead and look it up or go ahead and ask me. Uh, presentation time should be 20 to 25 minutes, and I expect that I'm going to be doing most of the lecture, but feel free to ask questions because I do want this to be an interactive class. First thing I'm going to go over is the history of the internet. It started in 1969. The Cold War had just begun. The United States was in fear that if a large nuclear weapon was fired and hit the United States, they would have no way to communicate. When a nuclear weapon is exploded over a landmass with electronic equipment, it emits something called an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. The EMP shuts down all electrical equipment and disrupts all communications. The United States knew that if uh, the Soviet Union did that, there would be no way to retaliate, and they would be a weakened state and be ripe for the picking. So what they did is they decided to form a new network of information called <coughs> ARPANET, which was developed by the Advanced Resource Projects Agency as part of the Department of Defense. They wanted to create a network that if an electromagnetic pulse was exploded over the United States and part of the communications grid went down, there would be still part of it functioning and the rest of the United States could continue to work. Uh, this, of course, they uh, started in 1969 and it continued to grow through the years. They added more networks to it and uh, they continued to build it across the United States until it became a network of networks so that it was getting closer to being an actual alternative to communicating in case that electromagnetic pulse did occur with a nuclear weapon. Uh, in 1983, they wanted to see what they could do about actually coming to that full realization of having a valid communication system because the networks that they had been developing were still acting as main, majorly backbones to the internet and if uh, many of the large networks went down it wouldn't be able to continue functioning. So in 1983 they broke apart ARPANET in the hope that they could actually get enough networks working on their own to continue processing information and continue communications. Well, within two years they found it wasn't going to work, that they still, not had, they still hadn't created a uh, uh, good enough communication system. So, in 1985, a new network, acting as the backbone of the internet, was created called the National Science Foundation Net, or NSFNet. Uh, in 1985, it linked 100 networks together. Today, there are over 20,000. Uh, it continued to grow until 1995, in which they were going to do another test, similar to the test they did with ARPANET in 1983, break it apart and see if the information uh, network would hold together, even though there wasn't the backbone there. Well, on April 30th, 1995, they did the final shutdown on their servers, and the full, uh, the full, uh, objective of the internet was realized. It became a valid communication source. In case part of it goes down, the rest of it works. It is, the whole still functions without part of it. 
Uh, today, uh, the internet has continued to grow, and as some of you may know, you may have used it, and you may have uh, researched information on it. It's become a lot more than they originally thought it was going to be in 1969. 1969, it was just colleges and military using it to transfer information, but now it's become a worldwide and household where everyone can get on the internet and communicate information just like they originally planned, uh, that they just originally planned for the military and colleges. Now everyone could do it, and if part of it goes down, the rest continues to function and you can still get information on it. Right now, the internet has become so large that originally in 1969 they didn't plan for it to handle the amounts of communication that it's handling now. The data transfer is getting too hard and it's uh, tearing apart what they originally had put, put together. So now, 110 colleges including MIT, Caltech, and Rice are putting together a new internet called the Internet 2. The Internet 2 is a new system of servers similar to the origi original internet but built specifically to handle the massive amounts of information that are going to be needed to transfer in the future. <coughs> it's uh, got better organization. They're planning ahead for future communities <coughs> of networks to come on, and they have special routines set up on their networks so that they will be able to be transferred faster and more efficiently. One of the major problems of today's internet is that a certain email file could be going across the internet and sit in someone's inbox for days and a important huge file that could take days to download could be backed up behind that email and the email isn't that important but the huge file is so now the internet too is going to be able to distinguish whether an important file is being transferred or a sorry loser fi file is being transferred and tell the loser file no way you're not getting through we're going to let this big file go through the internet is set up in several different ways, but the primary system is with the, I'll start off with the home computer. At the home computer, there are three different parts. There is the modem, the line, the phone line, and the computer itself. So you have your little computer here with the keyboard, and inside is a modem. A modem is a device that the computer uses to talk to the phone line and tell it what to do and how to transfer information. The modem t uh, communicates with the phone line, and the phone line goes up to a server. The server holds all the information that is on the internet. There are thousands of, ser of different servers throughout the United States, and they all link together to create the internet. Uh, the millions of home PC users, personal computers, use their modems to link up to the server that, which they are affiliated with and use that server to communicate with the thousands of other servers. When a computer communicates with the server, when it's reading a web page, it goes up and asks the server what information it has available. The server says, hold on a second, I'm dealing with somebody else, okay? And it's transferring information somewhere else. And when that user's turn comes up, it sends it information. The server sends the information to the home computer and the home computer reads information as a web page. On the server, the uh, information is stored as a text file in HTML. HTML is hypertext markup language, or the language in which uh, the computer reads how a web page is supposed to look. When uh, the computer gets the information from the server, it looks so, sort of like this. There are uh, different tags. HTML, this is HTML that tell the cert, tell the computer what to do. As you can tell, it's telling it to center it. So this is what it looks like as text. But when the computer reads it, it comes up as the word Nolan centered on the page. So do you happen to see? special program to read this HTML, the hypertext markup language. It's called a browser. And what a browser does 
is it takes the information that the computer is getting from the modem, from the server, and translate it, translates it from the HTML, the hypertext markup language, into something that a human can read as a centered node. For example, Example of a web page. Uh, as you can tell, it's Pearland High School Army JROTC web page. And when you look at this in text form, it looks like gibberish, just like the center no one did. Uh, it has a lot of uh, funky markup language, which is unreadable by a human, but when the computer reads it, it comes out pretty and nice looking like this. Uh, it's being read by a browser, as you can tell. The uh, gray part around it shows that this, the browser reading it and the window is showing what the uh, web page looks like. Here on the web page there are different functions. Uh, or on the browser there are different functions. There's the back button. The back button takes whatever page you were just looking at when you click it and takes you to the previous page. What happens when you're reading a page, it's stored in memory, which is called cache, and the cache acts as a trail of crumbs for the browser to go back through. When you click back, you can go back to the page you were previous to, you were previously at, and you continue going back. The same is true for the forward button. When you press back, you can also go to the page you were just at by clicking forward. Go to the page you were previously at. The stop button, when the information is being transferred from the server to the computer, the pressing the stop button will stop the information transfer. You won't get all of the web page, but at some points it's necessary when you're downloading massive amounts of information. The, uh, the refresh button re-downloads the information from the server about the, about the web page so it can make it new and see what updates have been made. So you click the refresh button to get it, see what the web page is now that you know it's been updated. You press the home button to go to the page that you have designated as your home page. What a home page is, is the page that when your browser starts up, that it immediately goes to. Like, for instance, on my mind, I have uh, in the Microsoft NBC site as my home page, so I can always go immediately to the news. So whenever my uh, browser loads up, it goes, I can read the news. Uh, the search button allows you to uh, go to a web page which you can input different data and different text in, type in words, keywords, and it'll search a database of web pages and bring up uh, web pages that have to do with the keywords that you selected. Uh, favorites. Favorites are the same thing as bookmarks. Uh, what it is, is you have a listing on your browser of the different important sites that you like going to a lot. Whenever you want to go to those important sites, you click favorites and a list of them comes down and you go to the site that you want to go to. Uh, print is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, font just changes the font. Mail allows you to read email and edit allows you to edit the web page. Uh, and like I said, the window where you're viewing the web page here, that is the viewing window in which it shows what the translated HTML looks like. Uh, you've heard me say a couple things like email and uh, that's part of an extra section of the internet. It's not just looking at web pages and reading HTML. The internet also consists of different forms of communication like news groups, uh, email, 
and different chat uh, programs. The way news groups work is you go onto a uh, server and you don't look at uh, forms in the form of HTML. You look at a simple, plain text. And people can post as many text messages as they want to in the news groups. And whenever there's a question asked in the news group, the next person that comes through, they read the question and they give an answer to it and they go back through the other text given. Uh, email is just a way to send text and, uh, messages to people you know. And the way an email address works is it's got a name designation such as mine, which is in wall. It has an at symbol and has the server that I'm affiliated with. And the server I'm affiliated with is Flashnet. Now, whenever someone sends a message to me through that email address, it comes to my computer and I can read the information they sent me. Email is especially important in today's world because with phones, you're not always sure that someone's going to be at home and uh, answering machines can sometimes mess up and you may not actually get the information to the person. And then, uh, so nowadays, you use email if you want to communicate a lot of information to a person written down. So all they have to do is pull up the email, read it, and they can even print it out. <coughs> and carry that information with them that you've just sent them. Uh, in order to communicate with the servers, there have to be standards. One, uh, one of the standards that have been established is, of course, uh, HTML, the hypertext markup language. Otherwise, if they didn't have standards, the two could not communicate validly. Uh, one server could do uh, communications with one server, one server could do it another, and then one computer could never communicate with all of the servers on the internet. There are several different uh, standards such as TCP, IP, and that's uh, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. And what that does is it tells the server how to send the information to the computer. Not necessarily what to send, that's determined by HTML. It determines how to send it. Uh, next there's HTTP which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is a part of TCP IP, and it tells the server how to send hypertext, like we've been discussing with the hypertext markup language. The second part of TCP IP is FTP, and that's File Transfer Protocol, and that tells the server how to transfer files, or just plain text, as HTTP sends the hypertext markup language. When a computer browser goes to an internet site, it usually goes to something like similar to www.flash.net. Now, what that is, is that's a domain name. And it's uh, registered under the uh, domain name committee. And what it is, is it's a word designation for a website so that humans can remember it. Normally, out in, uh, out in like computer land, when servers read website addresses, it's usually something similar to this. Now, people aren't going to be wandering around giving out email or giving out websites like that, like a phone number, because it's hard to remember. You're not going to be able to remember it when you go back home and you try to punch it up on your internet not going to be able to remember the number. So what uh, Domain Name Committee has done is it's asked for all servers that put together names like that, uh, numbers, to register with them and acquire a domain name so it's easier for humans to remember the name. From the domain name, you can usually determine what kind of uh, organization that you're going to. It's set up in three different parts. There's the prefix, <coughs> the main title, and the suffix. The pre 
prefix is usually always www, standing for World Wide Web. If it's not part of the uh, Central World Wide Web, it can be sometimes called www3 or www1, explaining that it's an offshoot. But the prefix is, is almost always www. For the, uh, the name itself, it's usually the name of the organization, like Flash. I'm part of FlashNet, which is the company. They call it FlashNet, but the primary name on their site is Flash. The uh, suffix can, is usually the part that designates exactly what kind of company they are. For example, this says Net. It means it's a network. It's a network of different users of computers who utilize their services for email, uh, file transfer, and reading web pages. Uh, there are other names, such as com, which mean commercial, mil, which is military, edu, which means education, and so on. That's how you determine what exactly what kind of company, organization, a web uh, website is affiliated with. So how much time do I have left? Are you keeping time? No, you are. Uh-oh. Uh, and I explain, I was explaining the browsers earlier. Our recent news, what's been happening is uh, different com two different companies called Netscape and Microsoft have been developing their own different browsers. They're trying to compete to see whoever wins, whoever can control the internet, basically is what they're trying to do. Because whoever builds the best browser is the one that the world's going to go to and they're going to continue using their browser until they control all the information that goes to uh, the desktop users. Microsoft has developed a browser called Internet Explorer, which is the one you saw right there. They recently developed uh, 4.0, their fourth version of the browser, and uh, it's met with a lot of controversy because a lot of the protocols that they've been using it conflict with the ones that uh, the rest of the Internet community uh, community has uh, agreed with and decided on. Now, in conflicting with them, they've had a lot of sp a lot of uh, lawsuits filed against them because they have violated the contracts in which everyone has signed on the internet. Netscape, on the other hand, had just come out with its fourth version of its browser, which is called Netscape Communicator. <coughs> its version complies with all of the protocols which people have been developing across the internet. And it also uh, is matches feature for feature with the Internet Explorer. The problem is, Internet Explorer is selling completely free. All you have to do is go on the Internet and download it. Uh, Netscape, on the other hand, its communicator costs around $35. So we have a conflict of interest. If you go with the absolutely free Internet Explorer who doesn't comply and is trying to run the Internet its way, or you can go to the Netscape Navigator, which is $35, but complies with all of the different protocols that have been developed. So right now it's a conflict, conflict of interest. And the browser that manages to win, the one who manages to uh, take the large mass of the market share, will be the victor. He will uh, manage to control all the information that goes to a de the desktop and determine the transfer protocol that they want to be used, since everyone will be using their browser. Now. When you use the internet, there are different sites you can use to do research on, and that's the primary use of the uh, internet. Whether you're looking for uh, information on the latest term paper, or you're looking for box scores on the um, Indians Orioles game. What you've got to do is you've got to know the sites to go to. For example, there's a site called www.infoseed.com, and you break down the name and you know that by the dot .com at the end, it's a commercial site. What InfoSeq does is you go to their site, you type in the keywords <coughs> on the search button on the browser, you type in keywords, and it brings up all the pages that have to do with the keywords you typed in. So like if you're looking for Indians Orioles box score, you type in Indians Orioles box score, and it'll bring up all the words with Indians Orioles and box score, and it'll match them according to the words that you said, or you typed in. 
Another such site is www.whoware.com. Uh, right now. Okay. That's it then, sir. You want to we've got a summation or a the summation? Well, uh, overall, the internet is a fantastic way to gain information, and hopefully now you should be able to uh, explain how the internet works and all of its parts, uh, describe the different functions of the internet, detail the three parts of the domain name, and give at least two sites where information can be researched. Any questions? When you're given a CPR, you have to look for the system. Uh, you have to find out if a person is pale or blushing in the face, chest does not rise or fall, no heartbeat or pulse. You can determine by their Adam's at the Adam's apple. Right here is the Adam's apple, and you can find out right here on the corner of the neck. Unconsciousness, if the person is not talking to you when you're shaking the victim lightly, I say, hey, John Doe, are you okay? Can you hear me? Or not exhaust breathing. Demonstrate the CPR. First, first you put the lay the victim on the back. Example, the floor. Or you can use a table. If a person is standing and the person is too tall, you can lay them on the table. Then you sit the victim's mouth. You hold the victim, you lift the, the victim's chin, and get the tongue and put it. And you lift the tongue and you put it on the tip of the end, like I right hear, and zip the way in the pieces in the mouth, like they have bread or something like that, you zip it away. Mm. Okay? Then two, you open the victim air by your, uh, your ten, feet ten back, and then lift the head back and lift the chin. Three, you look, listen, and feel breathing. You do your, but you, you get your face, and you put it by the end of your nose, and you feel any breathe. Then look at the chest and see if the chest is rising or falling. Then, if the victim chest is not rise, you tip the head more farther, farther back. Then six, you check for pulse. You find the Adam's apple, you go to the side, you're going to feel the pulse. And the one, the girl. same thing. The girl and guys have an ad example. It's right here. And you see the illustration. <laughs> then 
if you don't feel no pause, you have to do chest compression. To find a chest compression, you find the V on your stomach, you go right top up to the rib cage, you stick your finger, two drops your finger, and put your palm on your hand on the chest. And you do it like this. Not a fist, not a side like this. You like this on the side of the victim. To give the chest compression and the breath and retest the pause. For a dog, and for a dog or a child over eight years old, repeat the test five times. So you go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, and continue with this 15. You repeat a series of 15 chest compressions following two breaths. Four times, then we check for pulse. For an infant or a younger child that eight years old, repeat series of five chest compressions following one breath ten times, then we check for a pulse. Repeat the series of chest compression breaths and pause checking until the victim has paused or began to be on his own or medical health activity. So it stands, you keep on popping the chest and breathing. Every five every five cycles you check into it for pause. If you don't, do it at the end. If the victim is not breathing or the heart's not pumping, Keep doing it until the medical system arrives. Ten, if the victim is not breathing, but has a pause for a dog or a child over eight years, gets one breath every five seconds. The victim pause every 12 breaths. For a child between one and eight years old, gets one breath every four hours. The victim pause every 15 breaths. For an infant or one breath every time, every three, Second, chest will pause or uh, heartbeat every 20 breaths continue, continue until help arrives. For example, a person passed out. First of all, I say, join the, join the, are you okay? Slide it gently, do not jerk the person. You never know this person have injured his back or injured his leg. If that person do not sponsor me, then I check and see if I have, have anything in his throat or his mouth, like gum, candy. If not, I tip the head, I look, I tip the head, make sure his airway is clear, lift, feel any breathing, see his chest now the right, up, going up and down. If not, I start doing chest possession. I find his ribcage, I go up, put two fingers, put my palm on here, hand over hand, and start pumping. One thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, one thousand four, one thousand five, one thousand six, one thousand seven, one thousand eight, one thousand nine, one thousand ten, one thousand eleven, one thousand twelve, one thousand thirteen, one thousand fourteen, one thousand fifteen. Stop, push your nose, and breathe. Then do it again, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. But if you have two people together, one person do the compression, one person do the breathing. Okay? Like a person go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, breathe. Then that person go up and breathe. If you have any questions, go with CPR. Now, I need some volunteers. I volunteer, Robert.
first thing first? What's the first thing? Everybody? Check on him. Are you alright? John. Okay. <laughs> John. John, you okay? No. The second thing I do is sweet. Make sure there's nothing in his mouth. Keep it up for breathing. Welcome, uh, good morning. This is my uh, class that we're reaching for the star. It's about our for, for the formal inspection phase of our annual visit. Um, the formal inspection phase uh, occurs in uh, many parts. Um, it, they check, uh, check many things throughout the uh, inspection. Um, what I want to teach y'all today about is the main reasons they have formal inspection. Um, things to do before, the day before, after, um, and during the inspection, um, what, what not to do, and what they look for in each platoon, and, uh, platoon as, a, as an individual and as a platoon. Okay, night before you want to do uh, many things to get prepared. First, uh, you want to make sure your uniform is prepared, which means you have your shoe polished. Um, if it's cold uh, and we're doing a Class A jacket, you want to make sure you have your core insignia properly placed, polished. You want to make sure you have your pants ironed, your shirt ironed, all your ribbons in place. Um, and make sure it's squared away, hanging up, and ready to go. You don't want to stick it into the cleaners two days before we, you know we have formal inspection. Um, 
another thing you're going to want to do is study your material as far as your chain of command, uh, your range structure, um, and know your basic light level self. Uh, they won't expect the light one to know as much as the light three as far as uh, first aid and map reading and uh, military information goes. Uh, goes. Also, what you what you want to do is also get a good night's sleep. Uh, that way, you can be refreshed. You're not sleepy when you come up to the school in the morning. Um, that way, you re retain most of the information you studied your, uh, beforehand. Okay. On the big day, you want to make sure you wake up early. That way you don't wake up at 7.30. You want to wake up early so you can make sure your uniform is correct. Make sure you make any last minute correction. You have time to shave, shower, brush your teeth, comb your hair. You're not rushing up to the school or trying to catch your bus. Um, you want to be careful getting to school. You don't want to drink any coffee or, so coffee or sodas or anything in your uniform that might spill on your uniform. Um, you don't necessarily have to fast, but um, eat a light breakfast, don't eat heavily that morning. Uh, don't drink a lot of caffeine because when you get into inspection, um, you're going to start getting nervous. Your caffeine causes your heart to beat faster, you to breathe faster, to forget things. Uh, so when that inspector comes up to you, you won't, you won't remember a lot of the stuff you know. Um, another thing, uh, after you get... Uh, you want to eat a healthy breakfast. Um, you want to make sure no one, as far as uh, be careful getting to school, you want to make sure no one touches your brass. No one fiddles with your ribbons. No one no one throw mud. You don't spill anything in your uniform. You don't run through mud. You want to make sure you don't walk through white grass and let grass get on your pants and uh, your uniform. Um, when forming for inspection, don't talk. Listen to your platoon leader, your platoon sergeant. Um, when, uh, we, throughout the year you rehearse for this, um, we teach how to fall in for platoon inspection, for company inspection, and possibly for battalion inspection. Uh, what you mainly want to do is you want to listen. You want to pay attention, like it says. That's why you capitalize that. You want to pay attention uh, when they say dress right dress, you listen. When they say ready front, you listen. When they, uh, if you're a squad leader, when, they give, when you start giving the report, you don't want to stutter. Um, during the inspection, when they finally come up to you and they start uh, expecting every today, each individual, you want to answer loud and you want to answer clear. It doesn't matter if you get the answer or not. When you start off your reporting seizures, Sir, I'm Cadet Major Holloway, I'm 12th grade student, my third year of JROTC, I'm Battalion Commander of Paraland Order Battalion. You want to sound off loud and clear so they can understand every word you have. Um, Make sure you keep your bearing. Each time I uh, look out, you let once have a tendency to slouch at parade rest. When they call you to parade rest, make sure it's a modified position of attention where you just sit there and it makes it easier for you to stand out there in inspection. When you're at attention, make sure your hands are aligned to the seam of your trousers and you're looking straight forward. Otherwise, we'll get gay. I mean, we'll, we'll not get that gold star. It's going to be tough and it's going to be long and you want to make sure you pay attention because every little detail counts. Every person helps for the whole, whole battalion. You don't do not want to talk at all until you get into your next class. Um, the reason for this is that instructors are going to, uh, the inspectors are going to be watching everyone the entire time, and you don't know if you're in class, you're still being inspected because the inspectors are walking through the halls to the classroom, and after inspecting, if you're out in the hallway, halfway out of uniform, uh, dancing around, having a good old time, he'll just mark that off and. Um, it's We'll lose our gold star just because you decided to uh, uh, get out of the get out of the uniform or felt like you can unbutton your shirt early. Don't take off your uniform until you get home. This is or after school. When you get in your car and you go home, you can change out your uniform. And it doesn't matter until the next uniform day. 
But as far as today is concerned, if you have to go to wood shop, I'm sure for one day out of the year, you can sit down and they won't make you work because you're in uniform. If you're in uh, auto shop and all that. And make sure you still conduct yourself. If you're walking in the hall, cussing and uh, everything else in uniform and then inspectors catch you or any of us catch you, it just reflects bad on us and we still won't get that gold star because part of being in uniform is knowing how to conduct yourself and keep proper bearing to respect others. And that's what they're looking for, each inspector. A few points what the ins uh, inspectors are looking for is, did they keep their bearings? Were they slouching? Were they uh, moving around? Um, did they keep good bearings? Which means they weren't looking around, each time they heard a noise, or the car drive by when they're outside. Um, see, they also want to know how did you sound? Were you confident? Did you have confidence in yourself? Did you, did you have the key things that make you a leader as far as when they inspect you? Because that's, that's one of the main things they're looking for. Um, tone and confidence. When you answer, did you answer clearly? Did you answer loudly? Um, uniform wear. He had it. Did he have his uniform square away? Because your, your uniform is a reflection, reflection of you and a reflection of the kind. You know, your overall knowledge is from what um, I've taught you and the Army instructors taught you in the check that we have. We did a good job. Now, every little thing counts, even from bearing to knowledge and uh, to how you sound. Um, well, the reason they do informal inspection, inspections to test you and the battalion. We're a team. Each person works together as overall to work toward uh, the goal of thought. Okay, in conclusion, um, hopefully I've taught you what to do to prepare for inspection um, before, during, and after um, the formal inspection phase. Hopefully I've taught you uh, why they do formal inspection and uh, what the annual visit's all about. The annual visit is very important because that's how we get funding and other uniform parts uh, key things for RTC. It's a reflection of us. Do we deserve to still be around? Are we a good program? Because Houston has 28 battalions. We have one. Um, each year they, they get inspected every other year and each one has been around um, for about around 50 years. So, um, the Mini has a goal to start. It's not that hard to achieve. All you have to do is achieve 96 percentile. And this is a very important key card is to reach that goal to start. Quick, some questions. Um, what are some some of the things uh, inspectors are looking for when they're um, addressing? Chris, uh, Barry, knowledge, form, uniform squared away, and attitude. Johnny Compton, very good. Um, what are some of the things you should do? Before? The night before uh, formal inspection. Chris? You're four squared away. You're going to get a night's sleep and see if your U4 is polished and brass and scared away. Why is it important not to talk for, uh, before going to your next class? Because uh, it, other people might see you. They may dock points off you. Okay, very good. This concludes my. Uh, Pass over formal inspection. Hey Doug, how many minutes like you were? So I ran about twelve.
Chris, what do you think? Comments? Yeah, I think it was good. Yeah, it was good, I definitely. Think, I think you gave like a lot of information about it. It was real good.